Uh, now, on to the main event. I don't know about you, but I read what is possibly my favourite ever quote in the Sydney Morning Herald the other day. Yes. We have a saying in Wyoming, don't piss on my head and tell me it's raining. <laughs> If you haven't read the comment piece by Mr. John Fenton, we, we put it on our website, it's coming out in emails, you can Google it, but have a read. It's fantastic. It's also a response to Peter Reith's comment piece, which I've, by that reaction I've taken many people have read also. <laughs> Without further ado, I think um, Jess and, and Justin and everyone has already uh, explained why we're so thankful, but please, again, uh, here is John to, to speak for about 40 minutes. He's got a presentation. Uh, please welcome and say a big hi to Mr. John Fenton. This is, and that's what this is. 
Before we knew it, we had gone from 25 old wells that had been there since 1964. We live in an area where we have tight sands gas. The gas is trapped in sandstone lenses. Uh, it's not a conventional reservoir, as Jess spoke about, where there's this big pocket of oil or gas in the ground. It's actually in the rock. So for from 1964 through the late 90s, there were 25 wells there that didn't even pay for themselves. It was more of a, an exploratory process. They were experimenting. In the late 1990s, down in Texas, in a place called the Barnett Shale, Halliburton and some of the other major players whom I've seen their trucks driving through Australia, much to my disdain, uh, developed and perfected high volume slip water hydraulic fracturing. This allows them to come in and fracture the stone, prop it open with sand, and it actually allows the gas to come out of the stone particles and come up through the well bore. In our area, this took a well that never paid for itself and made a well that would pay for itself in six months. Uh, we also went from four years from 25 wells to over 200 wells. Uh, we also live in an area where we have a situation in Wyoming that we call split estate. My family and I and my neighbors own the service rights. Someone else owns the mineral rights. And when you're in that situation in the United States, you have zero say in what goes on when it comes to the extraction of minerals. We could not tell them where they could go, what they could do. We could not disallow them on our property. Uh, it took the control of our home and our land completely out of our hands. And we soon had a very remote rural area that wasn't industrialized, uh, very busy, 24 hours a day, big trucks, people everywhere, and we're stuck in the middle of it. Stuff. There we go. <laughs> so this, I wanted to, to show you what it's like there. This is north of our house, about four miles. It's a wide open, beautiful place. Uh, we spend a lot of time just out there. There's places you can go here where I imagine there's a lot of this in Australia. If the only person you may see is a, a white street going over an airplane. there you can see we still have it's a very wild place we have a large wild horse herd we call them mustangs in the states a lot of these horses are remnants from the spanish conquistadors there's been wild horses since they left them off there hundreds of years ago the native americans were probably some of the best horsemen on the planet in fact i've read at one time that the comanche indians out of texas were the finest light cavalry in the world at one time these are people that uh, lived in harmony with nature, and uh, it's probably one of the hardest things to deal with. It, uh, you know, there's been a mass destruction. We're now seeing that's something about this. This this industry, this type of exploitation, is the great equalizer. You're going to find out if this moves into your area what it's like to be the minority. You're going to find out that your rights have a dollar amount associated with them. Not only your civil rights and your rights to live and have a say over what goes on your property, but your health. Somewhere, somebody in one of these corporations has a fixed a dollar value of human life. You know, in the United States, we have this thing that's been going on that everybody knows about, about the terrorism and, and the way that some buildings were dropped in our country and people were killed. But I can guarantee you, uh, you have this coming to your neighborhood or into your rural areas and your water's poisoned and your air is poisoned and your land's devalued and you see your neighbors suffering. It doesn't take you long to figure out who the real terrorists are. And it's not a bunch of fellows that, you know, live in the Middle East and, and hide in caves. It's the politicians and the corporate heads of these companies who are willing to sacrifice you to, for their bottom line. So this is just behind our house. 
maybe kind of hard to see, but this is some of the rock art, the petroglyphs as we call them. The one on this side is from the, Shosh the Crow Indians. The one on the other side is the Shoshones. There's also the Arapahoes, the Cheyennes. Uh, this for me is a, a very special place because you can stand here right in the footprints of the person who created this piece of artwork. And I've spent a good portion of my life on the back of a horse in Wyoming and Montana and around the West. Uh, I've had the real privilege of being able to work and see some remote places. I've only ever seen the beautiful art, the occasional arrowhead or stone artifact of people who lived in harmony with the land and who were displaced and minimized and have been abused in the United States, who have had a lot of the oil and gas in the United States has been set aside in trust for the Native Americans. And they've been robbed and cheated of that as well. And then had their land destroyed on top of it. But we've been able to develop a relationship with our local tribal council leaders over our concern for the land and our period of time that it is our responsibility to be the stewards of that land. Nobody truly owns the land. We have the privilege of living on the land and being the people who should steward that and assure that generations to come have a place to live, to raise their families, and to connect with the land the way that I have been. And that is one of the most encouraging things I've seen here in Australia, is the we stood in the pillow with farmers, with what we call hippies, with everybody in between, and with native leaders. And people stood with a unified voice and spoke out against the destruction that's occurring there. So, we can talk about corporate profits, and we can talk about energy independence, and all the, the terms and all the catchphrases they want you to, to center on. But what this is about is human rights. This is about your ability to live in a clean environment and your ability to be free from the oppression of somebody who seeks to profit at your expense. Continue to stand together. Your greatest enemy in this is apathy. If you're willing to say, ah, uh, someone's working on this, it's not really my problem. That is more dangerous than any of the industrial activities that are involved here. Amen. So once again, thank you, Mark. I very much appreciate you being here. And all that your people can teach us is greatly appreciated. So we farm alfalfa primarily on our farm. We, it's a small acreage. We have 9,000 or 1,000 acres altogether, but only about 10% or 20% of that is actually farmed. We have a little over 200 acres that are irrigated. But off of that 200 acres in a short 85, 90 degree growing period, we put up six or 700 tons of hay. Feed black Angus cows through the winter, calve them out. Um, most of our neighbors do something similar, hay or, or beer barley or sugar beets or corn. This is just looking off the, the porch from the house to give you an idea of, of what it looks like. If you look out in the very background in the green, you can see a bunch of white spots. Those are oil and gas locations. Wellheads, production tanks, uh, metering sheds, separation facilities, compressor stations. This is a small field. This is shade over 200 wells. Uh, but it doesn't take, it only takes one, one to cause you a problem. Halliburton and the companies who deal with the hydraulic fracturing, the cementing and installation of the well bores have admitted in their own documents that there is an immediate, immediate 6% failure rate with well bore integrity. And over a 30 year time period, you're looking at at least a 60% failure rate of these well bores. They'll come in and tell you we have multiple layers of steel and cement that are going to go through all these layers and protect you. But just 6% is far too big of a chance to take. 
we found actually in our area that the failure rate initially was almost 50%. So before we ever had a fracking rig move in, we had big problems. We had the lower petroleum bearing zones communicating with the water zones, and things started to go bad in a hurry as soon as they moved in. So this is our home, as we were still building it, and the derrick in the background is 16 feet outside the minimum distance that they can be from our water well. We've got 24 gas wells on the 1,000 acres. Most of them are, we can see from the house, they're very close. Uh, we actually have one that's 100 feet inside the limit, you know, and, and I've heard said by some of the people here, that they, some of the Australian state governments and the national governments, we have the best regulations, they say. We have the most stringent standards. Well, Wyoming says the same thing. <laughs> and if you read some of Wyoming's regulations, I guess compared to the crap that they've got in the rest of the country, they are good. We have three or four inspectors for the whole state. The rules are not enforced. Their idea of an inspection here they would put the casing in the ground and cement it, and on the sundry, the forms that they fill out daily on the rig of all the functions they do, there would be a thing, cement inspection, and there would be a check mark by it. We found out what that was, is they call the Wyoming Oil and Gas Conservation Commission inspector on the phone and say, we cemented the well, and he'd say, okay, check the box. <laughs> out of the 200 wells drilled here, there was never one inspected by the state. So you can have all the paper rules that you want, but it's, if they're not enforced, they're not worth the paper they're written on. And they're going to tell you that over and over and over. Not only is this safe, and we've been doing it for years, but we've got the best regulations that there is. Well, there's one regulation that you need, and that's to ban this. In the United States last year, we actually had a net loss of jobs in the oil and gas industry. We had a fourfold increase in jobs in solar and wind and other renewable energies in the United States. There are people out there who have the knowledge and the ability and the know-how to lead us down a path of clean renewable energy, and that's the road that we need to take. Because I can assure you from living in this, it's it's not clean and it's damn sure not renewable. There's no way we will ever renew the damage that's been done. This is looking out a little farther. There's some old corn that's frozen down here. There's actually a little over 200 head of cows that are in the corner, but it's so tall you can't see them. And this is what it's like to live with this when they're doing this production. And they, we complained about it because there's lights all the time. And they told us, well, we'll, we'll buy you a hotel room. You can, you can go stay in a hotel for a while. Well, the nearest hotel is 35 miles away. We've got 200 plus head of cows and, and a full ranch and farm to run. They have no concept of what it's like to live on the land. And that's, that doesn't just happen in these ranching areas. As Justin said, this has come to the very hearts of our cities in America, too. There are schools in Fort Worth, Texas that have a gas well across the road from the playgrounds. There are football fields in Pennsylvania where high school kids do athletic events that have giant flare stacks in the background. This is an industry that knows no limitations as to where their greed will take them. So this, this is a picture taken from our front porch looking northeast. This is about eight, 900 feet off the front of the house. And this is what hydraulic fracturing looked like when it was going on in our part of the world. Everything you see spraying out of there is your guess as good as mine as to what that is. I can tell you part of it's CO2 because they use a massive amount of CO2 in these fracks to help break the soil apart. But it also was much closer. This is another shot of our home. Just over the back of the ridge where we stood with Jeremy and his staff and the other people from Australia, they were fracking a well. Over the period of a week, this happened 14 times. The first time it happened, I went up there, and 
wanted to get some answers. And the fellow in charge of the rig just told me, there's nothing wrong. This is all safe. Look at my men are walking around it too. And he was right. They were out there walking around in it. No respirators, no protective equipment other than a hard hat and some safety toed shoes. I can tell you how it made us feel. Your eyes would burn. Your lungs got tight. You felt nauseous. There was a film on the house. But the simple truth is, is that this industry moved into the United States government and rewrote the rules. When we had the unfortunate eight years of having Bush and Cheney as the leaders of our country, uh, Dick Cheney, who has been in the oil industry most of his life, acting as vice president, met with all the major oil and gas producers in the United States and from around the world, at the exclusion of any farm groups, any environmental groups, any civic groups, any city groups, anybody concerned about the negative effects of oil and gas were left out of these meetings. And they came to the conclusion that what should happen is this industry should be exempted from every major environmental law in the United States. So that's what they did. The Clean Water Act, the Clean Air Act, the Safe Water Act, the Superfund Act in the United States which deals with toxic chemicals and how they're stored and how they're cleaned up and how they're regulated. This industry is exempt from every one of them. So, when you see these politicians now in Australia that are making these cozy deals and signing drilling leases and acting as lobbyists, that's the tip of the iceberg. Every other industry, including us as farmers and ranchers, have to abide by these rules. Most of these chemicals, not only do they not have to apply to those rules, the lion's share of them are giving a categorical exclusion as being a trade secret. Nobody knows what they are. They don't have to tell the workers what they're being exposed to. They don't have to tell you what's being injected into the ground and the water under your feet. So when they say to you that this is safe, when they say to you that we've been doing this and we know what we're doing, they know a couple things what to do. They know how to buy government and they know how to change the rules in their favor. And you can stand up and say, if this is so safe, I want to know every one of these chemicals before you ever set foot in my state or my township. And I'll guarantee you they won't be able to do that because it's not safe. And they don't want to tell their dirty little secrets. So this is kind of what our area looks like now. The blue dots are water wells and the red dots are gas wells. <coughs> we live up about where the left hand green spot in MW is that. We live right in the middle of that. Uh, this has not only changed our landscape, contaminated our water, contaminated our air, but we now have property values that are worth nothing. There are people here who have worked for two or three generations to build the farms and ranches that they call home, and they couldn't sell them tomorrow if they wanted to. Then if you survive the drilling and the hydraulic fracturing and all the pipeline laying and all the stuff that goes along with that, then you get the privilege of living in a working gas field. This is just right in front of where the petroglyph picture was taken. Just to the right of this tank is the main irrigation canal that feeds water to our whole place. What happened here was a worker came in and backed a large truck up to this, they call it produced water. It contains not only all the fracking and drilling chemicals that come back up with that liquid, they contain all the contaminants that exist in the gas burning zone, which for us is a lot of very light in hydrocarbons, BTEX, benzene, toluene, ethyl benzene, xylene, and radioactive material. Uh, it's, it's produced water is a stretch, water is a stretch. He pumped the, the fluid into the truck. And when he left, he forgot to disconnect the hose from the back of the truck. And it pulled the valve out of the back of the truck. So he just drove around in a circle until his truck was empty and then he went home. And we were moving cows through here, going through opening gates, getting ready to move animals through. And 
we found this mess. And I stood there as I was taking pictures and trying to get somebody to come pay attention. And ultimately, the person in charge of regulating this told us the gas companies do a good job. Even after emailing this picture to me, I really don't think that I need to be out there and hung the phone up and left us to deal with it on our own. Uh, this water started to change. This liquid started to change colors from the black that it had started out to, and it turned kind of a rusty orange color and green, and it got lumps in it like big pieces of cheese curd. And uh, I finally got one of the workers out there who works on the wells and asked him, what's, what's going on with this? And he said, well, we've got bacterial problems in all the gas well here. Because when they were drilling them, and when you drill a well, the drill bit's hollow, and they pump what they call the drilling mud down through the middle of the bit, and it helps lubricate the drill bit, and then it washes all the cuttings that they've drilled out, back up the outside of the drill bit, between the drill bit and the hole that they're drilling, and brings them to the surface. But there's something called lost circulation that happens. That mud goes down through the drill bit, and as it comes up, it finds a weak spot in the well bore, and it exits out into an aquifer or into an underground fissure. And there's times when hundreds of barrels, and a barrel in the United States is 44 gallons. It's a large oil drum. We've seen on the sundries where they lost 100 barrels, they lost 1,000 barrels, or 1,500 barrels of mud into an underground leak. So to stop this, they use lost circulation material that they add to the mud. That can be anything. It can be wood chips, it can be shredded paper, shredded tires, anything that they can think of to put down the hole to plug that, they do that introduces bacteria into the subsurface. You get sulfate-reducing bacteria, you get slime-forming bacteria, so you get all these things that are nasty. So in order to deal with that, they put biocide down the hole. <laughs> and they'll tell you that things are done differently here than they were done in the United States, but when we walked around the location in the Pilica a couple days ago, there were pallets and pallets of biocide sitting on location in big blue jugs right on the side, biocide. So, they're trying to kill the bacteria underground because it interferes with the production of gas, but it also kills all the beneficial bacteria. And with the high failure rate of well bore integrity that we have, that biocide is leaking into the subsurface as well. It's showing up in the water. It's showing up in the samples that have been done there. So there's far-reaching effects past the drilling and fracking stage. This is a blowhole that came up through the field. As we irrigate, everything is gravity-fed. It starts up in the mountains, the water runs down through the canals. Everything is on a slope for us, and we use gravity to move water through the fields. So every 30 inches we have a little furrow about this big that the water runs through the field. And we went down real early, I, the dog always goes with me to change the irrigation water. We heard the funny, this gurgling, rumbling noise. And out about 30 feet from the head of the field was a big mud pot boiling up through the field. So, we got the water shut off, we got the company called out. This well had only been in production about four years, so it was brand new infrastructure compared to the rest and it had blown apart underground. And everything that was coming out of the well, the gas, all the produced water that we've talked about, came up to the field. So, from here to the bottom of the field where our irrigation water exits is probably 1,000 or 1,100 feet. We now have a spot, half the width of this room, the full length of the field, that's just gone. So you remember, we only have a shade over 200 acres of the farm there. They just chop pieces off of us all the time. They came in and destroyed our privacy and destroyed our environment and destroyed the, the, the view. And now we have to deal with the constant degradation of the agricultural 